Hello, hello, hello. Today I'm going to be talking about this little baby. Yeah, this little mono price compact THX satellite speaker. Now this sucker comes in a pair for about 250 bucks or you can buy it as part of the home theater in a box set. Five of these speakers with an eight inch subwoofer for about $409 currently. So really what you're getting is 250, 250, 500, half of that 125, another 300 for the sub. Oh man, that's a heck of a good deal if you buy the whole set. But anyway, I was surprised to see just how well this little speaker performs. I was loaned this from a viewer. So if you know who you are, stand up, take a bow, make sure you leave a comment in the comment section below so everybody can thank you and give you a thumbs up for sending these in to me for review because yeah, I think a lot of people are gonna be surprised. So with that said, let's go. Just, just look at it. It's a little four and a half inch coaxial coincident driver. You see a little tweeter in the housing and they did a really good job on this tweeter connecting to the mid range because every coaxial speaker, the mid range acts as a waveguide. And a lot of times what you'll see is cheaper coaxial speakers where the tweeter will be mounted out in front of the mid range. When you see the coaxial, or I should say, when you see the tweeter mounted inside the mid range like this, then that usually indicates that it's gonna be a good design. And in this case, it is a pretty darn good design. And another thing that I wanna note is the tweeter has a housing around it that merges well to the cone profile of the mid range. And then the mid range, doesn't really have any large surround. So it's a smooth, nice step to the surround, which also helps the frequency response. Now, as I said earlier, these speakers are part of the compact THX lineup, if you will. And this is a little box. I just want to show you this real fast. Check it out. You can see inside of it, pretty lightweight. It does feature a little mount that you can just put a screw in the wall and just hook it in there and you're done. So getting back to the THX stuff though, this what I'm showing you on the screen is the different certified performance classes for THX and compact is actually a size. And right down here we can see THX certified compact products for smaller sized rooms up to 1000 cubic feet in size with an eight foot viewing distance from the screen. That's what this speaker is qualified for when it says it has a THX compact rating. It's this darker blue area right here. And then as you go larger, larger rooms, then you would get out here. The speaker is not intended to play loud in a large room. It's just not going to do that. You're going to see the evidence of that in the data below. But I will say that I was truly, genuinely surprised at just how good the speaker sounds, especially when pointed off axis by about 30 degrees. That really is the sweet spot for the speaker, which means that you don't have to point it right at you. In other words, if, you know, if it's off the side at 30 degrees, you don't have to have it aimed at your listening position, this toe in, toe out stuff. You don't have to toe it in toward your listening position. You can actually have it facing parallel to the back wall. With that said, we'll go ahead and talk about some of the things I heard, which was the speaker actually surprisingly gets down to 80 Hertz, F3, anechoic, pretty well. Now sensitivity is about 80 decibels. It's really, really low. You're going to need some decent power or realistically what you're going to need to be doing is putting these in a small room or close to near field, meaning that you can put them on your desk and listen to them as a pair of monitoring speakers because they do well. You'll still need a subwoofer and this goes for listening at further distances as well, but they do well for a near field speaker and they do well for a mid-field speaker as well. Again, referencing back to that THX compact specification, small room, okay? The neutrality of the speaker is really quite surprising. There is a dip at around 1.6 kilohertz. We'll talk about that in the data. I didn't find it to be a problem per se, but it is there and it does take away some of the attack, some of the crispness of certain instruments, in particular brass, I've noticed that, but you can equalize it. So that's kind of cool. You can equalize it back up, but when you do it, you're going to introduce a little bit more distortion in that area. So you got to be careful. 
Overall, though, it's a neutral speaker, and there's really not a whole lot to say about it in terms of how it sounds. The one thing that bothered me about it, it was the treble is just a little bit too hot, and I attribute that to the good about the speaker, which is that it has pretty good constant directivity in the tweeter region. And because that dispersion is not narrowing, and instead it's staying relatively wide throughout from 2 kilohertz to about 10 kilohertz or so, that means that all the reflections are pretty equal in intensity. So it builds up as you go higher frequency and you don't have a sloping response in the high frequency, but you can equalize that down pretty simply with just a simple shell filter. It's not a big deal. Or you can play around with toe in, toe out, and see what works best for your own likes or dislikes. Before we get into the data, let's talk about how it was measured. This speaker was measured using my Klippel Near Field Scanner, a state-of-the-art device that allows you to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room, like you see this garage set up right now. Now, actually I've moved, so it's in my dining room, but I don't really wanna film that because I'm ashamed of how terrible it looks. You just have to take my word for it. That's where it's set up right now. But yes, it literally is in my dining room. Starting off with the impedance. The impedance actually is rather low for this speaker. I was surprised. So the AVR might be questionable. I would say for the most part though, you're probably gonna be okay with a standard AVR for this particular speaker because you're gonna be using a crossover to a subwoofer. So that's gonna alleviate some of the uh, tension, or <laughs> I shouldn't say tension, but the load on the AVR. Of course, you could use a separate external amplifier as well, and that might be better, especially if you're gonna be using multiples of these. This is the frequency response on axis with the speaker pointed directly at the listener's position, zero degrees, not towed out. And that means that this response is a little bit worse than the 30 degrees response, but I will show you that a little bit below. The average sensitivity, as I said, 79.5, so roughly 80 decibels throughout. And you can see that it's not perfectly linear, but within reason, it's about plus or minus three decibels. Some hot spots, again, you've got this dipping going on around 1.6 kilohertz, and then you've got a peak just above two kilohertz that really kind of drive that linearity to be out of spec or out of bounds of what I would consider really good. Again, it's a small satellite speaker, retails for about 250 a pair, or you can buy the whole 5.1 setup for $409 at its price. That's not too bad. F3 is notable at 81 Hertz, F10 at 60 Hertz. You're gonna to need to subwoofer, but it does get down to 80 Hertz. And that's kind of what you would expect out of a THX spec speaker. Now I talked about that dip at 1.6 and I know that people are going to ask or assume maybe that the tweeters polarity is out of phase with the mid ranges polarity, or I should just say the tweeters out of phase with the mid range. Maybe they're wired up backward. People were wondering. So I tested that. And what you see is the tweeter polarity unaltered in black. So I did not touch the speaker. This is just the initial measurement. And then I took the drive unit out. I disconnected the wires and I flipped the polarity on the tweeter. And then I measured it and that's what you see in blue. So actually the polarity is set up correctly as is with this 1.6 dip right here. Otherwise, if you chose to flip the polarity thinking that they did it wrong at the factory, you'd be making a big mistake because you'd suck out a whole lot of energy from about two to three kilohertz. Don't do that. My best guess is that there is a notch filter of some sort in the speaker that's bringing that down and we'll see evidence for why I think that's the case below. So going to the CEA 2034 measurements, same thing that we saw earlier in terms of linearity, it's the exact same measurement, but we've got some additional measurements as well. And the one thing I wanted to point out is the early reflections directivity index, which gives us an idea of how EQable is the speaker going to be. Now this is pointed directly at you on axis. And for the most part, you know, it looks pretty good. You get up to this crossover region and there's a little bit of a step, but it's not severe. So I'd say for the most part, you're gonna be okay to equalize the speaker to your heart's content. Notably, this area, this 1.6 kilohertz area, is not an issue in terms of directivity. So you could actually EQ this up. And I would say a graphic equalizer could probably take care of that pretty easily. Just bump it up about three or four decibels. But when you do that, you're gonna increase the distortion to that area. I don't know if that's a good thing. Now let's see what happens when I turn the speaker 30 degrees off axis. This is what you get, and it smooths out a good bit more. I'll flip back, 
and then back to 30 degrees, zero degrees one more time, and then 30 degrees again. Now, it again, it smooths out. It looks much better than it does at zero degrees. But the main thing is, look how smooth this early reflections directivity index is. This speaker is going to take extremely well to equalization. You're going to be fine to equalize it and alter the sound profile to your liking. And that's good because this is the estimated interim response, which is going to kind of give you an idea of the tonality that you can expect in the seated position in your room. Zero degrees is black, 10 degrees in blue, which is pretty much the exact same thing as black. And then 30 degrees is in red. So we can see that the red again smooths out. There is a little bit of difference in the higher frequency, but there's a bunching up of it around one, two, three, four, five, about five to maybe seven kilohertz or so. It kind of stacks on top of each other. So right in there is going to be not a lot different when you turn the speaker on versus off axis, but you can equalize this area down, this up through here. So this kind of gives me an idea of the trend line of the sound compared to the mid range. Compared to the mid range, the high frequency is going to sound a bit bright, but like I said, you can just EQ that down without any problem. You're going to be using the speaker as a home theater box type setup for a small room. Your AVR should be able to take care of this. No problem at all. This is the horizontal dispersion at about plus or minus 70 to 60 degrees, depending on what frequency you're talking about. Everything looks good here to me. This is the vertical dispersion. This is pretty much the exact same thing as the horizontal dispersion, maybe just slightly different. And you've got about plus or minus 60 degrees to 70 degrees, again, depending on what frequency you're talking about. In other words, you can aim the speaker pretty much however you want to. You can sit above or below it pretty much however you want to or you need to in your room. And you're going to hear roughly the same sound profile. It's not going to be identical, but within about plus or minus 30 degrees vertically and off to the side, the speaker is going to do very, very well. Here's where we have problems, distortion and compression. Starting off with distortion, the speaker, low sensitivity, going to take more power to drive to get high volumes. The distortion does not look great at 86 decibels at one meter. And then at 96 decibels at one meter, it's really bad. Again, an indication that this speaker will not be good if listened to at high levels or far distances. Multitone distortion, really high, probably one of the highest that I've seen so far. And then if I cut it off at 80 hertz and above, it does bring some of that mid range down, maybe just a little bit. Let's see. Mm, not a whole lot, not a whole lot, but maybe just a little bit. The interesting thing though, is how the high frequency is increasing there. And I'm starting to notice a trend with coaxial drivers where they do that. And I'm starting to wonder, am I, am I showing now the modulation effect of the mid range as a waveguide? Could be, could be worth noting though. Now, if we look at compression, this is probably the worst compression I've seen short of using a limiter. So what I'm getting out of this is the same thing that I've gotten out of the distortion. Don't expect to crank these up. And also make sure you use them with a subwoofer because the low end is going to go crazy. When I tested the speaker for my compression testing at the 96 decibels, I didn't hear a lot of mechanical issues from the driver, but at 102 decibels, I thought I blew the speaker up. I really did. I was surprised that it could handle it because of the noise that it made when I swept it. I really did. I thought I blew the speaker up and I was like, well, that kind of sucks, but luckily I didn't. And that's, it for the data. If you want to see the rest of it, I'll have it on my website soon, if not already by the time you watch this video. In conclusion, 250 bucks a pair for these little dudes. That's a pretty good deal. But the $409 for the 5.1 setup that includes an 8-inch subwoofer, which I will be reviewing very soon separately, that's a no-brainer. For a small room, say you've got an apartment or a bedroom or something like that, no-brainer. I mean, I have... You know, like it's hard for me to say that this cheap speaker that cannot take power is a no brainer. But again, it's all about the context. If you're going to put this in a medium sized room or a large room and expect it to do well, that's your own fault. You've seen all the data. I'm not trying to be mean, but really like as a consumer, you now have the information to know that it's just not going to do that. But in smaller rooms, it's, it's a definite recommendation for me or from me, if you're interested. 
If you like what you see, please don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. If you're interested in joining my Patreon to help support my channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. I will probably drop a affiliate link in the description below. And if you want to call that shilling, that's great. But I've given you tons of data for you to make up your own mind. And I've told you the limitations of the speaker. If you still feel like the speaker is good for you and it fits your needs very well, please consider using that affiliate link. That helps me earn a small commission at no additional cost to you. I thank you all for watching and I hope you learned something. Talk to you later. Take care. Peace.